right. Very good. Well, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. And uh, we're glad that you joined our September virtual luncheon of the KC Downtowners. My name is Stan Myers. I'm the president of the KC Downtowners. Um, my day job, I uh, also work for Terracon uh, as the client development manager. We are a uh, engineering firm headquartered here in Kansas City. And for those of you here on the call today who might be new to the KC Downtowners, uh, let me just share with you that uh, we are an informal association of Kansas Cityans who live, work, and play in downtown Kansas City. And we are dedicated to downtown development and to promotion of a positive community spirit. And um, as has become our tradition during the past year and a half, we highlight a special nonprofit uh, who we encourage uh, everyone here to support um, in lieu of uh, the normal luncheon. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, this month, we have the special honor of welcoming Jewish Vocational uh, Services. And uh, this is, excuse me, um, especially appropriate given all the uh, attention on forced immigration and refugees. Uh, so it is my honor and privilege uh, to welcome Hillary Singer, who is the Executive Director of Jewish Vocational Services, to tell us about JBS. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stan. Thanks so much for, for having me join you today. Um, it is a pleasure to be with you and to share a little bit of information about JBS and our work. Um, I am going to share a couple of slides just so that you have something to look at um, while I talk. So let me make sure that I can do that. Okay, so um, this is JBS. We are uh, the largest refugee resettlement agency in Kansas City. We have been around since 1949, and we've really been doing the same work since that time. We were started by the Jewish community to provide support to Holocaust survivors who were making their way to Kansas City and needed some additional support, adjusting to life here, um, becoming employed, um, you know, and anything that, that they needed to, um, to help adjust to making their way in a new society. And so that was sort of our, our genesis is within the Jewish community and for Jewish individuals that were coming into Kansas City. Um, and our work now is the same kind of work. We help people adjust to, to life in the United States, but we work with people from all over the globe of all different backgrounds, ethnicities, religions, um, and help them make their way into, into our city so that they can um, take advantage of the opportunities that we have to offer here and so that they can contribute back to our community. Um, the way that our work, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk here for a little bit first about what a refugee is really briefly. So the bulk of our work is with refugees and immigrants and a refugee is someone who has been forced to flee their country because of persecution, war or violence. And they have a well-founded fear of persecution because of some unchangeable aspect of themselves, their race, their religion, their, their ethnicity, um, something like that. And they've been forced to, to flee their home. So we work with refugees that come from all over the world. Um, and right now we are preparing ourselves to help welcome Afghan refugees who should be coming into the United States over the next few months. Um, I think it has been sort of unavoidable to, to see on the news what's happening in Afghanistan um, and the fall of the government there. And the response from the United States is to open our, um, our arms and welcome those who have supported US forces and find themselves in peril because of that. Um, and so, you know, it's a, it, it is a process that they are developing sort of as it goes. I think no one anticipated the speed and volume of um, the number of people that might need to be evacuated. And so most of the people that we expect to see in Kansas City are still overseas somewhere. They're not in Afghanistan anymore, but they've been evacuated to a second country and are undergoing all of the screening processes and checks and things like that. And we anticipate that um, 
maybe up to as many as 300 people will make their way to Kansas City between now and the end of March. So that's sort of the timeline that we're looking at. And then the services that we provide people with are um, our community integration services. So everything that somebody needs to, to start their new life, housing, um, support, um, getting kids applied for school, um, medical appointments, things like that. Um, our health and wellness department helps people who right, have chronic medical conditions or need some additional support. Um, the individuals that are coming from Afghanistan, we anticipate will um, experience some of them, the, the side effects of trauma, depression, anxiety, mental health challenges. And so we'll be there to support them with that. And then um, of course, workforce development, employment programs that um, will help people identify um, how to best use the skills that they have brought along with them um, and how to, to, to join our workforce. So that is a, a sort of quick overview of where we find ourselves now. Um, with the Afghan situation. We continue to welcome refugees on an ongoing basis. I think we have 15 people coming this week um, from Democratic Republic of Congo. So our work is ongoing separate from the um, Afghan situation. And if you are interested in supporting either by making a financial donation or volunteering or purchasing something off of our Amazon wish list, um, we're responsible for um, furnishing homes for people when they when they get here. So um, we have a wish list full of all of the things that you might need um, to to start a new home: dishware, you know, kitchenware, um, sheets, towels, um, anything that you can think of. Um, and so any support that you can give um, through that wish list or to get involved as a volunteer would be much appreciated. Hillary, thank you so much you. For, for sharing that story and, uh, and for the wonderful work that you're doing. I think uh, let everyone know, Kim has put a couple of links in the chat uh, where you can go to the uh, Jewish Vocational Services website and make a donation, which uh, we, we uh, encourage all of you to do if you can. And then there's also a link uh, to, uh, to a website that is promoting uh, welcoming, uh, welcoming Week, which uh, I was not familiar with and Kim brought it to our attention here a couple of weeks ago when we were together. Uh, this is so well-timed uh, because September the 10th through the 19th is officially Welcoming Week. So to learn, to learn more about that, uh, just click on the link in the chat. So Hillary, thank you so much. Um, we are also grateful as an organization to have corporate sponsors who, uh, who have been uh, great partners for, to the Casey Downtowners over the years. And this month is no exception. We have a wonderful sponsor in BHC. They are a, a regional civil engineering firm that is also uh, headquartered based here in the Kansas City area. And today we have, uh, through the magic of Zoom, uh, all the way from Wichita, Kansas, President Kevin Hanemichael, who's going to tell us about BHC and maybe in particular focus on some of the work that they uh, do in, in digital uh, communication and broadband, which is very uh, apropos of our uh, featured speaker today. So Kevin, I'll let you take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Stan. I appreciate the opportunity to sponsor this lunch presentation because it directly aligns with the work that we do every day. BHC is a civil engineering and surveying firm located in the Metro. We provide engineering and design services for public works, land development, and telecommunications projects. Our telecom projects include long haul systems, which connect cities, oceanic cable landing projects, which connect countries, and FTTX projects, which connect homes and businesses, as we're gonna hear about today. I have been an advocate for about a decade that broadband is critical infrastructure, like water, sewer, and electricity. However, it had always been driven as a discretionary service driven by the private market. The pandemic drove home the necessity of broadband access for all as a matter of work, commerce, education, healthcare, worship, and really every facet of life. We also realized that having a data connection on your phone just isn't enough. It's all about broadband connectivity and fiber is how high-speed data is moved. The issue 
is the cost to construct in urban areas as well as rural areas. And for communities, those whose residents have access to affordable broadband will succeed. And those who don't, won't. I'm really looking forward to our speaker, uh, Rick Usher. We've got to know each other over, over a number of years. Um, but for some background, I would like to show a video, a short video that shows how the fiber to the home projects evolve. Since 1992, BHC has been providing civil engineering services across the United States, connecting communities near and far by designing fiber networks that cross land and sea. Fiber to the Home, or FTTH, is the installation of fiber optic internet directly to a household, apartment building, or business. Fiber provides individuals internet service without sacrificing quality, connectivity, or bandwidth allowing families to stream, work, and learn using multiple devices all on a single network. BHC takes a FTTH design through the following steps. The first being data scrubbing and validation. In this step, analysts ensure the initial data received from an auto-design software is accurate. Step two, constructability write out. A field analyst will drive the route to confirm apartment buildings and vacant lots. CRO also confirms cable placement along the right-of-way. At the conclusion of the CRO, an engineer determines whether the fiber will be aerial or buried. Step 3. Final Engineered Design and Drawings Analysts reflect the changes from the previous stages back to the fiber design team who create the final engineered drawings. Step four, permitting. Permitting begins early on for each project. BHC coordinates closely with each jurisdiction to address any potential conflicts. After BHC analysts and engineers complete these steps, the design is ready for construction. Households are now becoming connected through the power of fiber optics. BHC Engineering, delivering connectivity to communities. All right, well, thank you for the opportunity to sponsor. And Stan, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Kevin, thank you so much. We really appreciate uh, your sponsorship, of course, but also the, uh, the great work that uh, you and your firm have done uh, for, the, uh, for the community uh, over the many years and throughout the region. So, so thank you again. And it's a perfect segue to our guest speaker today, uh, who, you know, the, uh, as the saying goes, needs no introduction, but I'll try and, and, and give a brief one anyway. Rick Usher uh, recently retired assistant city manager after 25 plus years. Do I have that right, Rick, with, with the city of 36. Kansas? 36. 36. Okay. Yeah, well, LinkedIn uh... profile. So I don't want to cheat you out. Uh, any, any years of service. I started when I was seven. Okay. Very good. Yes. Excellent. <laughs> Th throughout your career, you have uh, uh, been involved with, uh, with uh, smart cities, uh, broadband, digital equity and inclusion, and just a tireless worker for, for the city and, and promoting many you know, other nonprofits and, and volunteer organizations that, that have the same cause. And back in 2010, I believe uh, you were part of a team that uh, took on the, uh, the RFI that came out from, from Google to uh, bring Google Fiber to Kansas City. And so we're excited to hear that story. We're excited to hear maybe tales of your career, you know, that's printed throughout. And uh, I'm gonna stop talking and, and, and turn the floor over to, uh, to our good friend and fellow Casey Downtown or board member, <laughs> at first as well, having a, a board member speak as our future speaker, uh, Rick Usher. All right, thank you, Stan. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here. I. I think this might be the first time I've actually been a speaker at the organization, but uh, yeah, thank you. And and as you pointed out, I've just passed my uh, my first month uh, free of uh, local government employment. I I started uh, my own uh, practice as the Usher Garage. I'm uh, working in public policy, digital access, and entrepreneur support. So. 
Um, we can put some information up about that. Uh, check out ushergarage.com. Uh, I've got a little bit of information there. So um, it's, a, it's a tribute to uh, my grandfathers who actually ran the Usher Garage in Plainville, Connecticut from sometime in the teens or 20s of the last century. And, uh, and then to uh, you know, startup entrepreneurs that uh, have a long history of starting in garages. So um, I've been uh, on the downtown, uh, uh, downtowners board for a few years. And at our last meeting, like Stan has pointed out, you challenged me to tell the story of uh, how we got Google Fiber. And um, you'll recall that in 2010, Google released their Fiber for Communities RFI with a stated goal of building an experimental, and that's key to understand about what was happening in 2010, that it was an experimental symmetric gigabit internet service to see what could happen if consumers could become producers unhindered by unreliable, uh, slow internet services. I have uh, some slides I'll, I'll share here that um, should make this hopefully a little interesting. Um, and I've, I've given uh, presentations like this, uh, you know, kind of around the country in the last uh, 10 years. This, this project is for me personally in my career uh, has, has been a game changer. And, you know, as we've seen, it's been a game changer for um, Kansas City. So um, in the spring of 2011, the world was surprised to find out that there are two Kansas cities and they were both becoming the test bed for a new kind of internet. The National Broadband Plan had come out with a recommendation for 10 megabit per second upload, I'm sorry, download as an internet speed to aspire to. And Google's challenge was to 10X that idea and make it a symmetrical at a thousand megabit per second. That's a hundred X, right? Sorry about that. <laughs> When the uh, first Google Fiber connections were made in 2012, Kansas Cityans were suddenly faced with the dilemma expressed by a friend's daughter whose first reaction to Google Fiber was, what am I gonna do with the five minutes I used to spend watching a 30 second video? This, uh, this slide um, represents um, really the epicenter of the, uh, the city's response to that RFI back in 2010. If you'll recall back in 2010, we pretty much had just two co-working spaces in Kansas City. This is Office Port uh, that was at uh, 19th Terrace and uh, 19th Street and, and Wyandotte. Um, entrepreneurs at this location had actually started trying to respond to the RFI prior to reaching out to the city. Um, my involvement in, in, the, in the project uh, came about because Councilwoman at the time, uh, Councilwoman Cindy Serco had been contacted by this group. There was a gentleman named Tom Ruddy, uh, who was uh, kind of the en enigmatic leader of this uh, initiative. He had um, started a website, um, obtained letters of support from corporate leaders around the city, but it really wasn't until uh, then city manager Wayne Cawthon assigned me to help facilitate this response and work with Councilwoman Serco. So we used Officeport as our uh, base of operations. Uh, there was a gentleman I remember, Tony Sheets, that suggested we use Google Docs. Uh, at the time, I hadn't really used Google Docs or even known about them, but they turned out to be an incredible way to share openly and transparently how we were responding to the RFI what uh, Google was asking for in that response and how we were putting that together. Uh, it really was a community-wide collaborative effort. We had over 117 participants in that um, proposal, in, in that response. Um, and uh, let's see what else I got here. Th this, uh, so the Kauffman Foundation really helped uh, support the initiative. Um, once uh, we got the phone call from the Google team uh, that just said, hey, we wanna to talk to you about your response. Um, we started having conversations, uh, Councilwoman Serco, uh, our city attorney and others at, the, at City Hall. And then slowly we built a local team 
I mean, I say slowly, but kind of rapidly, we built a local team to keep up with the requests from Google for information on how we would be able to assist them in deploying this gigabit network. Um, and then in uh, 20, uh, sorry, 2011, uh, when this announcement was made, this is uh, some of the uh, public relations that the Kauffman Foundation helped us with. And, and actually, this was one of the major points of conversation during our uh, first meeting on negotiating the cooperative agreement. Kaufman had also made the coffee mugs. So this might have actually helped seal the deal. We brought a couple of dozen of these coffee mugs and uh, our city attorney. Now, it was also at that time that we got one of the first indications that we weren't alone in this you know, coming announcement. Um, the receptionist at uh, Polsonelli, the, the negotiations took place at Polsonelli offices, asked our city attorney if he was with the unified government of Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas. So we, at that point, uh, started seeing that there would be two Kansas cities in this, in this announcement. Um, and that led to uh, what I call the biggest bromance of the 2010s was uh, Sly James and Joe Reardon uh, forming the uh, mayor's bi-state innovation team, uh, really putting together an effort to figure out how as a region, we would be able to take advantage of this um, gigabit network opportunity that, uh, that Google was bringing. Um, so March 17th, uh, was when we actually submitted our response to Google Fiber. Uh, January 19th, 2011 was the first call that, that I uh, received. And uh, actually it was maybe six weeks later that I looked at Councilwoman Circle and said, okay, I don't think we're getting punked because they had come to the city in person and we actually knew this was uh, Google Fiber working with us. Uh, March 30th, 2011, uh, Google Fiber was announced in Kansas City, Kansas, and then May 17th uh, announced in uh, Kansas City, Missouri. So that, that um, time frame, there, there had been discussions of a joint announcement. The Google team was fascinated with state line and, and actually state line road that you have two Kansas cities separated by a public street or in you know, some parts of the region, the river. So there, was, there were conversations of a big street party in, uh, on State Line Road. Uh, Google had made 39th and State Line, what they called their showcase area, highlighting those businesses in that corridor, both sides of the State Line. Uh, or uh, even interesting idea on a barge in the Missouri River. Uh, but um, in the end, in the, in the agreements, Kansas City, Kansas was able to come to agreement more quickly because their Board of Public Utilities was essentially a department of the city. On the Missouri side, we were working closely with uh, Evergy, then uh, Kansas City Power and Light, uh, to assist them in really vetting and you know, doing the due diligence on how a uh, privately held public utility, which is you know, really what, it, what Evergy is, privately held public utility, would show benefit not only to the, the city and the Kansas City region, but to their customers and their uh, shareholders. So that due diligence process uh, and, and their attention. So really without Kansas City Power and Lights uh, or Evergy today, their you know, hundreds of thousands of utility poles being part of that agreement, uh, we, we really wouldn't have been here. So a lot of thanks and hats off uh, Chuck Kaisley at Evergy was, was very instrumental in, in a lot of those negotiations. Um, my role in the project, which um, I can back up for a second, I think some of the importance of me wanting to make this presentation today is to show the opportunity we have in the coming federal infrastructure bill. And this is really a once in a century opportunity for funding of projects of this scale. So how the cities reacted to Google Fiber, how we worked with them to build out the network. These are lessons learned that can be applied to moving forward as a region 
with this infrastructure bill. Part of our agreement was to form a technical committee. So I facilitated that technical committee, but I engaged city departments, public works, parks and recreation, water services. Uh, we had outside agencies. We had Evergy was part of that group. We had the engineering firms doing the deployment. And what we were doing then was helping to initially show where fiber huts would be located, execute the agreements for those properties. And so we've got a lot of experience then in how cities can share the right of way, share uh, infrastructure. Uh, as you can see now, um, you know, Google Fiber and others are partnering with jurisdictions on uh, uh, cooperative agreements, public-private partnerships. So um, then what's what's really key, and I think this, this is a, a tribute to the Kansas City region and, and something that frankly, I think the region has a history of for the last, you know, whatever, how long we've been around 160 years of helping prove new ideas and helping in this case, prove this experimental fiber network as a viable business operation. And, and so this was uh, very key in 2012 when uh, executive chairman at Google, Eric Schmidt, uh, made the announcement that this is not an experiment. We're actually running this as a business. And then that shortly led to their announcements of expansions in Austin, Texas, and, and then other cities around the country. Um, today, uh, we have um, 22 cities in the Kansas City region that have entered agreements with Google Fiber. Um, and then another, another key point, and, and something again toward the conversation on the infrastructure bill, is that we really need to be talking in terms of symmetric gigabit speeds. Um, the infrastructure bill has up that uh, speed. The definition of broadband at the FCC has been 25 megabit download, three megabit upload. Uh, as we saw in the pandemic, that is not sufficient for remote learning and distance work. So this symmetric gigabit speed um, you know, really is what, what uh, again, I'm pushing in, in the region that we look at as uh, we put together any proposals uh, to the federal government that, that we look at fiber and that we look at the symmetric gigabit speed as a starting point. Um, and then this, of course, led to this groundswell of community activity. These are entrepreneur events uh, that, that took place around the region. Um, at the same time, Google was completing their outside plant. Um, they didn't share data on like number of customers, that type of thing, but I, I did, I was able to have our planning department compare maps of their build area that we pulled off the website with census data. And we were able to show that at that time, uh, fiber was available to over 210,000 households and 440,000 residents. That is about 97% of the population that would have the opportunity to be able to subscribe now to gigabit services. Um, and uh, this is just more about that schedule. Um, And then a million cups, the other, the other things that again started locally, a million cups started at Kauffman Foundation and then expanded, they expanded this across the country and around the world. Uh, Wednesday morning meetings with startups to pitch their, work on their pitches and help them with their companies. Um, Startup Village, um, you know, what are we gonna do on a gigabit? Uh, this was a, a, a photograph that was in Fast Company Magazine. And if, uh, if you're not familiar with the Startup Village story, um, it was a, an incredible phenomenon. At the time, as I pointed out, we had two co-working spaces. So startups were just jumping into houses around the area of 45th and State Line and um, uh, investor uh, startup entrepreneur supporter, Brad Feld purchased a house um, Matthew Marcus, Adam Arredondo are legendary and what they've done uh, there. And then that led to the uh, Startup Foundation, 
to uh, start land and start land news. So uh, the incredible reaction in our entrepreneur community to um, gigabit speed internet and it attracted uh, uh, folks from around the country. Uh, the, the gentleman standing here in the hoodie, um, Mike Demarea, he uh, came to us from uh, Boston and had a company, I believe it was called Handprint. Uh, he was in the Feld house and, and spent, uh, I think like three years here in Kansas City. Um, it, so uh, the, other, the other issue that really made front page news during the Google Fiber deployment and, and marketing was the digital divide in Kansas City, Missouri. And these are uh, screenshots from uh, Google's signup map. And, um, and as you could see, the neighborhoods uh, on the, the east, east si side of Kansas City, Missouri, were not signing up as, as quickly as neighborhoods on the west side. And, and unfortunately, Troost Avenue uh, showed itself again as this historic uh, boundary that has defined symmetric ra systemic racism in Kansas City over the, the history of our city. So uh, Aaron Deacon uh, at KC Digital Drive um, and some others launched this program, Paint the Town Green, because what was happening was um, residents on the east side um, were unable really to come in and show their interest for, for several reasons. One though, or, or two of them were that to sign up, you had to have internet access to be able to go to this website and express your interest. And you needed a credit card to, um, to actually pay what was then a $10 like interest, uh, expression of your interest to subscribe. And so through this program, um, we were able to, you know, basically go door to door with school district representatives with neighborhood representatives and and get uh, folks uh, signed up so that we could ensure that that Google would then build out across as much of the city as possible and I need to point out that in the development agreement Google Fiber specifically noted that they were seeking to connect residents in economically distressed neighborhoods. Uh, they, they expressed that during site visits that we had. Um, at the time, uh, Anita Maltbia was leading the Green Impact Zone in Kansas City. Remember that effort that Congressman Cleaver sponsored? Uh, they had a lot of information about uh, residents of economically distressed neighborhoods and the, and the barriers to uh, them at receiving internet access. Um, and this is a, like an unsolicited analysis. This is from a, a report done by the University of Sydney and Arizona State University. And when you take a first look at this map, um, you have to look closely to realize, so the blue areas are areas where they determined through their research, Google Fiber was available. And they did this just by going to the Fiber site, entering addresses, to see if the plan was available at specific addresses. So they, this was created again by these, these, these university researchers. The blue areas are areas in, in, and they only looked at Jackson County and Johnson County, Jackson County, Missouri, Johnson County, Kansas. So the areas in blue are areas where they found fiber to be available. The areas in red are where fiber was not available. Um, the area in red here in the middle this is Leewood, Kansas. So this is not Troost Avenue. This is State Line Road that, that shows itself to be a, a difference. And so, so Leewood uh, today, I don't believe they even have a, an agreement with Google Fiber. But you can see that throughout the, the east side of Kansas City and uh, the northeast neighborhoods, that service is, is available. And they made some... Uh, observations in their reporting of how uh, their determination was that the city and Google Fiber were able to achieve an equitable distribution of the uh, system. Um, just some photos of construction and, uh, and then just this groundswell of community activity. So again, back to this infrastructure bill, you know, we're going to invest in, and, and my recommendation would be that we 
look at public private partnerships on the scale of basis of what we had done at the city of Kansas City, Missouri, and at this uh, Wyandotte County uh, city of Kansas City, Kansas level of forming public private partnerships to assist. And, I, and I'm talking a lot about Google Fiber, but Spectrum, Spectrum has really upped their game in Kansas City. They offer, uh, I think when you look at some of the ISP finder maps, 980 megabit download speeds across most of the region. Um, AT&T uh, is building out their gigabit service in some Kansas City neighborhoods, there's still, I think, quite a bit of work to do with AT&T on the digital equity side. But um, we have a really unique situation, I think, in the Kansas City region on the number of internet providers we have, the quality of the services and the speeds that are offered. So partnering with them to assist any number of internet providers to can complete the build out of their gigabit infrastructure and their fiber infrastructure would be our best investment um, of those infrastructure dollars. Um, this is a, uh, a Google fiber map that again, I mentioned 22 cities in the region. Uh, that one's a little old. I, I haven't been able to find a new one. Um, then um, I, I pointed this out where Eric Schmidt um, had said, uh, we're in this as a business. So. Um, then what that has led to when, uh, when Google fiber showed its interest in the Kansas city region, that immediately led to Cisco and our own hometown team at Sprint, then, you know, pre T-Mobile, uh, and, and others joining in this initiative, Mayor James opened the, uh, office of innovation. Uh, the innovate, innovation officer, Ashley Hand, and then Bob Bennett, um, both uh, assisted in building out the smart city initiatives and the, and the uh, fiber network was a, a real motivator to that. Um, and this is more about those smart city initiatives that were taken on. Uh, last speaker we had, uh, Keystone Innovation District, where Kevin McGinnis um, talked about the, the proposal here at uh, 18th and, and Troost. Um, these, th this type of development, I, I, I think would be critical, you know, going forward to help the community even further understand the, uh, the availability of gigabit services, the innovative and entrepreneurial activities that could take place there, and then the workforce development that could happen. Um, I have been tracking uh, over the last uh, six or eight years uh, what I've been calling emerging innovation districts. And you can see around uh, Hospital Hill, which is the UMKC Health Sciences District, uh, the, the activity there, on the, and the, of course, on the healthcare side, and then down in the uh, Volcker campus area of UMKC, you've got a high concentration of um, technology uh, companies there. Midwest Research probably being the oldest in Kansas City where uh, you know they've been doing uh, this kind of work for over 75 years. Um, and then um, this is, you know, again, as, as we look at how we form partnerships with other ISPs and other companies to come here, this was why Google decided to test what they called their, it was a 3.5 wireless tests that they did in Kansas City, but they, they used this slide in a presentation at our city council where they just talked about why they're testing in the metro area, that we understand technology innovation, uh, that um, we haven't uh, worked well on innovation uh, topics. I'm sorry, I got the wrong click there and that um, having this gigabit network regionally opens up their ability to deploy uh, wireless, wireless services. And uh, we, we've seen that kind of parallel to this wireless carriers deploying 5G. Um, we, we have a very aggressive um, pole attachment policy that allows carriers to construct small cell sites throughout the city using uh, city street light poles. And uh, we're, we're of course trying to help increase that deployment of technology. 
Um, this uh, is something I've been calling the seven steps of acceptance of the gigabit revolution. And uh, if you understand the seven steps of acceptance of change or, or, uh, or grief, it's kind of like from the internet service provider and, and in this case, right after the Google Fiber announcement, Time Warner, their chief executive said, there's no consumer demand for a gigabit infrastructure, gigabit internet, uh, which is of course the denial stage of uh, the acceptance of change. Uh, Comcast, and there were other cities where AT&T was contributing to defeat mayors who were trying to bring gigabit speed internet to their cities. This was a case in Seattle. Uh, the bottom half of this is a photograph of our uh, technical team that I mentioned. Uh, we met uh, weekly over that course of that, that construction. Um, and then uh, depression. So depression is a step of acceptance of change. Uh, Time Warner, suddenly forced to compete in Kansas City, complained Google Fiber has an unfair advantage. Uh, what they failed to mention and what AT&T failed to mention was that a couple of years prior to our response, an RFP had been put out for a similar partnership on a smaller scale project that Public Works was doing to extend fiber networks to their traffic control system, and there were no respondents. Um, so we, uh, we also knew under state law that we had to offer these same benefits to these other competitors and and they did take advantage of those of those benefits on uh, expedited permitting and fee waivers and other construction this is uh, the top photo here is a fiber hut that's in uh, gillam park at one of the park facilities there uh, and then you get more toward um, Bargaining, and this is still happening today. Uh, you're probably all inundated with this in your mail from Spectrum and from AT&T and other companies saying, "Hey, come back. We have 300 megabit internet." Or "Come back. We'll, you know, we'll we'll pay for this to happen." And then AT&T saying, "We're going to build our gigabit network in Overland Park." So uh, this uh, is kind of a slide I've been using to just demonstrate what we went through in Kansas City. Um, kind of a play on Mount Everest and, uh, you know, Kansas City, Missouri, Kansas City, Kansas were first to the peak. Uh, who remembers the 50th person to climb uh, Mount Everest? But we are in a situation where we have the tools now to help build these gigabit networks across uh, the country. Uh, and then my last slide is just this uh, quote from Walter Risten about capital uh, going where it's welcome and staying where it's well treated. Um, and, and that yes and approach that we took in our negotiations and the ongoing relationships that we've had and now that we've built with the other providers, um, Spectrum, AT&T, uh, Verizon, uh, T-Mobile, um, we have a coalition for digital inclusion. Uh, they all participate in that and, uh, and we're trying to just help uh, bring more of this digital economy to the Kansas City region. So um, I'll, I, I'm also, you know, interested in questions that, that folks might have. Um, I think uh, I can take any questions that might, that might have. Rick, we, we do have some questions that came in on, on the chat. Th thank you. That was a great presentation. And, and uh, in, in a way, almost kind of a strange walk down memory lane. It's uh, it's, uh, you mentioned, for example, 1 million cups, and it's like, I, I remember when those were kind of all the rage, and then we had the Startup Village and, and Startup Grind and all those, and it was like Kansas City was constantly talked about in the same vein as Seattle and Austin and, 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 and all these other places of innovation. So that, and those exciting times still continue. Uh, the questions that we have, uh, Cynthia is always good for a question, and she did a list this time. Uh, let's see if I can get to it here for you, Cynthia. Um, going back to when you were talking about the original deal with, with Google Fiber, uh, has this type of deal been repl replicated elsewhere and is the region in better position than other communities to benefit from the, uh, the upcoming infrastructure bill? 
Um, yeah, the, the agreement, uh, well, so initially, you know, it was, it was uh, to be an experimental system, uh, but it, 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 it has been used as the template for uh, the other cities that, that Google has gone to around the country. Um, and with the other cities in the region, I'm sure you know they've modified that over time. Uh, what we've also seen is more, uh, e even even like deeper public-private partnerships. And Huntsville, Alabama, is a great example where they had uh, I get, been building a fiber network. They had conduit, they had fiber, and they they worked with Google to um, enter a cooperative agreement on conduit sharing. And, uh, and fiber sharing. And I know that other uh, internet service providers have done that. Um, I, I would say that uh, you know, what I'm recommending to, to groups like uh, Casey Rising and the Mid-America Regional Council is that we go back and take a closer look at these agreements and, and other agreements related to the, the, the project deployment. You know, I mentioned fiber hut locations and pole attachments um, and, and other construction techniques that have, have become available today to then basically start a library of these to be used by cities and counties across the Kansas City region. So if we really look at this uh, as, as expanding the gigabit region in Kansas City that, that we need to pull other governments into this and share these lessons learned so that um, that we um, sorry here that we um, continue to grow on, on what we what we've seen. So we we, we are you know sharing this information with uh, the state of Missouri, the, you know the uh, Missouri Broadband Office that Tim Arbeiter leads, um, and and we've uh, you know been working again through this Coalition for Digital Inclusion to try to share this information. Very good, Th thank you. Uh, Robert Anderson asks, uh, how, how big a factor was the $10 sign up uh, and were residents aware of that? And perhaps maybe uh, uh, tied to that, he's got a follow-up uh, uh, question, comment. The PR on the front end uh, was heavy on bridge, uh, bridge the digital divide. And the result was a reproduction of the existing digital divide, especially in the initial wave of neighborhood hookup prioritization. How far have we come towards that original marketed equity goal? Um, you know, that that really is the the question we're trying to address right now, and um, affordability affordability continues to define. Uh, the digital divide in, in Kansas City. Um, all of the uh, ISPs have uh, some type of discounted program for low-income families. You know, if you have a student in the school lunch program, uh, you can get um, services. But uh, and then and then Google's thinking on this has evolved over the years. Initially, it was um, pay the three hundred dollar connection fee and you get five megabit download speed free for uh, seven years. They've been transitioning people off of that plan, um, but uh, it really didn't work as a digital equity tool because frankly, because eviction, unfortunately, is a business model for a lot of property investors in the Kansas City region. And, and uh, as an example, in the, in the uh, Kansas City School District, 70% of the students have Two different addresses during the school year. So there's housing mobility. There's housing mobility because of eviction practices, and that then would not motivate someone who's going to, you know, potentially not even live in the house a year to pay a connection fee. So, so then what? What Google is doing today, and they, they started this a few years back, is, is a offering they call broadband. And initially, it was a 25 megabit download, three megabit upload speed that met that definition the FCC had for broadband. Uh, they made that available on their site in census tracts that their algorithms told them and data showed to them were areas of low internet subscription rates, you know, low internet adoption, as well as economic uh, disparities. 
uh, during the pandemic, Google increased that speed to symmetric 100 megabit speed. Because like everybody that has experienced uh, distance learning and remote work that you, know, you, you need a higher speed internet to maintain a quality connection you know, for what we're doing now, what we're still doing today. Um, so that, that resilience uh, of, the, uh, of the network and, and just the demands you know, being put on uh, uh, broadband. Uh, but the, uh, so Google did a study in 2012 of the digital divide and highlighted these issues that were causing you know, people to not be able to subscribe. And again, price was, was the issue. Um, we're working on some solutions to that. Uh, at KC Digital Drive last year, they launched the internet access support program that helps low-income families pay for their internet services on, by any carrier. Uh, and then the federal government uh, launched the emergency broadband benefit, um, again, uh, last year, that pays a $50 a month subsidy to households that, you know, for a number of reasons, aren't able to subscribe to internet services. And so at the Coalition for Digital Inclusion, at PCs for People, at the libraries, other organizations are trying to get the word out to residents that that's an opportunity, you know, to obtain internet services. But the digital divide does remain as, as our largest challenge in the region. Very good. Um, Nelsie Sweeney asks, uh, again, kind of tied to the to access uh, across the entire region. Why is the Missouri River the cutoff on all of your tracking? And why don't you measure or track anything in the northern one third of KCMO? Can you read the last part of that again? Sorry. Uh, why, why is the Missouri River the cutoff on all of your tracking? And why don't you measure or track anything in the northern one third of Kansas City, Missouri? Oh, the, the, the map that I showed, uh, that was prepared by that uh, university study that I uh, talked about. Um, no, we, we do look uh, across the entire metro. And uh, I'll, put, I'll drop a link in here to a, a really valuable tool that, um, that my sidewalk created uh, last summer. It's, a, it's an incredible visualization of the, uh, the digital divide in the Kansas City, in, in Kansas City, Missouri. They did similar reports for um, Johnson County, Wyandotte County, Clay and Platt counties. Uh, Jackson County, but uh, oh, where's the chat? Oh, I'm looking at it. Sorry. <laughs> uh, this is it's called the KC Connectivity Report, and it, it does show you by census tract um, poverty in that census tract and internet subscription rates in that census tract. Um, uh, I think I think a big part of the reporting though is that the digital divide is most prevalent in the Kansas City's third city council district. Um, and some of the census tracts in that district, um, less than 40% of households have internet services. Uh, when you look at this report and, and you are north of the river, Southern Clay County, um, there are some census tracts there with low rates of internet subscription. Um, but for the most part, the, the Northland uh, has very high rates of subscription to internet services. Um, but uh, yeah, we do try to take, of course, a citywide approach to this. Very good. And, and as we're closing in on one o'clock, I'm gonna uh, combine uh, a couple of questions here. Both Kim and Brandon have asked uh, regarding the new infrastructure uh, well. Uh, Kim asked, how do you see the new infrastructure package integrating here? Uh, Brandon asked, how does 5G affect this infrastructure? And I'll just throw a third wrinkle in here because what we've kind of all gone through here uh, in the last uh, year and a half, and we maybe had a new appreciation for the importance of FTTH, the, the new abbreviation I just learned today. Um, yeah. How does this all shake out uh, uh, 
in in the uh, infrastructure bill that uh, is forthcoming, and, and maybe how we view this as part of infrastructure uh, moving forward. Yeah. Well, so that that is a great question, and it's part of I think what's. Uh, coming up, uh, I mentioned the Special Interim Committee on Broadband Development. What I'm hearing from uh, like Representative Riggs and, and Representative um, uh, that um, as they're going around the state, they're hearing different issues around the state. And so, you know, I, I, we've talked about, you know, fiber to the home, wireless services, uh, there are, you know, Wi-Fi, mesh Wi-Fi networks, there's, there's many technologies that can get internet service to you. And then of course, there's many devices that you can use to access the internet. And so 5G uh, predominantly is, you know, for your smartphone service. And, and uh, there is more and more that you can do uh, on the smartphone. And, and studies have shown that there's much higher uh, adoption, you know, you would say more more folks have smartphones than have computers. In fact, smartphone access on the internet, smartphones being used to access the internet, uh, surpassed desktops and laptops as the primary go to about four years ago. So it, it's, but when you, and in fact, I've had some debates with folks who have said, well, you can't do schoolwork or you can't write a term paper on a smartphone. And so I actually stopped answering the question because other people in the room would say, hey, I'm using Blackboard at my school or I'm using Canvas at UMKC on my you know, device right now. So that, that's kind of where some of our population is. And then others, uh, uh, older residents um, are, are having you know, some, some other challenges in connecting say through a smartphone. So they still have a laptop, a tablet, an iPad. Uh, so, but but frankly, you know, they, they all work together, and and as 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 you know, or maybe you know, as, as I know, um, you know, I, I've got home internet service, I've got wireless service, I, and I'm and I'm using both almost interchangeably, um, but but everything really comes back to fiber, uh, and and fiber is is the technology that um, you know, frankly. There's no more life to be drawn from Ma Bell's copper wires that were strung 120 years ago. Uh, and I think that, and, and in fact, I, I'm understanding the AT&T is actually disabling some services that are still being delivered that way around the city. Um, but uh, you know, fiber has been called future proof. And uh, every, every pole you see that has a, a small cell site on it is served by fiber. So. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> well, very good. Well, thank you, Rick. And, and it, it's uh, it's uh, somewhat uh, uh, humbling to, to find out that my laptop is not considered old school. So <laughs> we'll just we'll keep on adjusting to the fact that new things are, are always coming our way. And, and uh, that, that's just the nature of change. Uh, Rick, thank you again. Uh, thank you all uh, in attendance today. Uh, you know, we, uh, I think I speak for everyone here that we appreciate so much uh, your your service to the city, your passion for downtown, your commitment to, to this particular cause, and and, and and having the vision to recognize that this is the means by which we can bring our whole community together. So so thank you for all that, and uh, I know you're going to continue to be part of the Casey downtown as well. So Rick, thank you so much. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, it's a beautiful day outside, so I hope you get to go out and enjoy some of this uh, wonderful Kansas City afternoon. And we will see you in October. All right. Thanks, so much. Thanks a lot.